Thank you very much. Bye. See ya. Hello. Hey, hey Clay Chalkville, what's up? Hey, what's up? How are you? Good. <laughs> I'm going to take just a second to get my stuff set up here because um, I'm doing a like I've got a slides deck too. So give me just a second. All right, good afternoon. Um, we'll go ahead and, and get started. I think we'll probably have some more folks joining us. Um, hopefully people aren't having trouble getting in. So I'd love it to hear how your day's been going. If you guys wanna unmute and tell me a little bit about um, what you've learned today. Our last uh, session was about poetry, which was, uh, I didn't really know, I didn't understand much of it, but you know, it was cool. Um, and then, oh, we learned about diversity and like on your like teams. So you have like different voices can tell different stories instead of just like the same vanilla, the, you know, oh, this is Norman. Yeah, you're all right. Oh, sorry. Hey, Norman, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Good. Here we go. This is Franca. I'm Lauren. This is Tiffany. I'm Tiffany. Tiffany. Ah. Amazing. <laughs> He's not in our class. Don't worry about him. Okay. That's yep, that's all for us. So I'm Misty Matthews. Um, I am the strategic communications manager for an organization called Keisha Harrison Associates. And what we do, we're like a consulting firm. So we go in and help organizations with leadership development and we do a lot of work around racial equity. Um, mostly with philanthropic organizations. So like um, some people call them charities. They're not nonprofits, but they're like organizations that give out lots of money basically to nonprofits and to other groups that are really deserving of it. Um, and the session today that I'm leading is opinion writing for political and social issues. And I'm not sure, can you guys see the whole of this slide or is it like cut off on the side? It's, it's a little cut off. I think it's like, it says opinion writing for political and social issues, but then it's like cut off on the. the yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, I, I think it should be fine, but um, sorry about that. So I'm going to start off with a checking question for you guys. So I want to hear from each of you. Um, and if we have other people join, we'll try to catch them in. What's your favorite kind of candy and why? Or if you're not a candy fan, what's your favorite snack and why? Ooh, I got one. Okay. Ferrero Rocher's. Is that how you say it? I think so. Yeah. She said, oh, yeah. Those are good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, because it's tasty. <laughs> it's got Nutella and like it's got layers and it's crunchy, but then it's soft and then nutty. 
Yeah, that's a solid choice. <laughs> I like the uh, oh, no. I like the um, I like Skittles, the red pack, um, because they're yeah, sweet yeah. and chewy. <laughs> What? Um, my favorite is Swedish fish, mostly because I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't really have like a favorite like snack or candy, but like if I had to choose one, I would say the sour skittles. Like just because one moment they're sour, the next they're sweet. Just like yeah. sour patch sour kids. kids mm. yeah. Oh, I love sour patch kids watermelon. <laughs> oh yeah, those, those are, are good. so good. <laughs> What's your favorite color? <laughs> what? <laughs> The red one. Um, mine's like a really, really dark green, like almost black, but it's green. Yeah. Mine is the blue. Mm. What? Oh, color Skittle? Oh, um, no. Oh. Okay. oh, oh, I thought you meant like color in general. <laughs> I thought you were just asking everybody's favorite color, and I was like, okay, you do. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, really, really dark green. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I want to answer the question. What's your favorite candy? <laughs> I'm not a part of this class, but I want to answer the question. Okay, come on. My favorite candy is Sour Patch Kids because I love rainbows and I like sour stuff. Like any rainbow candies. Candy. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, so I would say mine is probably Reese's Cups. Mm. Uh, it's like that combination of peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. It's so uh, good. Um, if you ever go, if you like ice cream and you like Reese's cups, go to Sonic and they do a Reese's blast and it's so good. So, um, the reason I chose that checking question is because you actually practiced sharing your opinion and explaining why you have that opinion. So it was a fun checking question, but it was also a little bit of a example of, how you can form an opinion and share it with somebody else. So the reason I wanted to talk about opinion writing on political and social topics, um, number one, I do that for my job. Um, I do a pretty good bit of writing about like racial equity issues, but also there's just a lot going on in the world. Like if you guys haven't noticed, like you haven't looked around, you know, you got your mask pulled over your eyes or whatever. Um, there's a lot going on in the world. There is currently a trial going on in the Senate to um, convict the former president who has been impeached by the House. Um, you know, there are lots of conspiracy theories around the relate the election and QAnon and just lots of stuff going on in the world. And then we're also in the middle of a global pandemic, which is a whole issue unto itself. So um, having opinions is definitely a good thing. Being able to share them in a way that engages your readers and also like makes you look good. That's also a good thing. And so I wanted to share a little bit more about um, the process that I take when I'm writing an opinion piece and sort of some things to think about um, if you want to write a piece that is both well-informed and engaging to your readers. So um, I, I outlined like three steps that I think are good steps to take when you're thinking about writing a piece like this. And the first one is Google it. So if you think that you've got a hot take on a current event or a current topic, um, you could be right, or you may really just be wanting to say something that a bunch of other people have already said. And so it's always a good idea to take a look at what other people have said about the topic you wanna to write about. And it also helps inform you, like it helps you to actually learn more about the topic so that you can present it in a way that is um, smart and engaging, funny if you want it to be. Yeah. So, oh. yes. And hey, guys, I'm going to mute you while I'm talking. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't I think you good. realize it's totally fine. <laughs> I was just talking and I was like, wait, <laughs> what, did, what can I hear that? Um, thank you. So, you know, like I was saying, Google it, look it up and, you know, try to figure out, are you actually adding something to the conversation? Like, do you have something unique to say? Or are you just kind of repeating things that have already been um that have already been covered. And so 
Um, number one, you should look to see if you have a fresh take, like I said, that you're adding something new to the conversation. And, you know, you can also consider even if somebody else has said it before, that doesn't mean that you can't say it. Um, you might find a different way to say it, or you might have a different audience from the other person who said it. You know, there may be a person who's writing for, I don't know, the Washington Post, and maybe people in your hometown don't read the Washington Post. And so you have something to say to the students in your school, or maybe like to, through the local newspaper that you think would be really impactful to people in your community who might not read it elsewhere. Um, another great thing is when you have a personal connection to a story. And so that can come in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, if you are living with a disability and there is um, legislation related to your specific disability, um, if you're a person of color and you want to talk about um, the, the riot at the Capitol on, on January 6th, um, that can offer a unique perspective and particularly being a student, I think that's a pretty cool advantage that you guys have sometimes is that you're younger than a lot of people who have who are publishing opinions about some of these topics. And so it actually offers a really unique and interesting perspective that might not be found elsewhere. And then again, a new perspective. So even if your take is similar, um, providing it through your own lens is really important because, you know, like to me, it doesn't matter that you're like 15 or 16 or 17, like, you have a voice and you can use it to say something. And I think that's really important. So yeah. <laughs> so um, the second thing after you've kind of done that initial um, reading up on the topic is to actually like dig in and do some research. Because when you're writing an opinion piece, like it's really easy. I mean, you can just sound off and write an opinion piece. I could write an opinion piece about just about any topic you gave me. Um, and it would just be based off whatever's in my head, which, you know, sometimes that can have value. Sometimes you have your own lived experience that can really speak to a topic, but often your own, even your own lived experience can be made more powerful by providing facts and data and other supporting evidence that maybe can win people over to your opinion. So it's not just, you know, you're not just the kid from, um, and I'm sorry, I've totally blanked on which high school you guys are from. Which high school are you guys from? Clay Chalkville. Clay Chalkville. You're not just the kid from Clay or the kid from Chalkville or the kid from Clay Chalkville, um, but you are somebody who is well-informed and has something to say about a topic. So um, again, do the reading. Like that is Sometimes to me, that's one of the hardest parts. Like when you feel passionate about something and you really feel like you have something to say to like take a step back and actually examine, okay, like what, what is it exactly that I want to say about this? Why do I believe those things? Are those things really like an accurate representation of the situation? And what evidence is there to support my beliefs? You know, like, why is it that other, other people should listen to what I have to say about it? So being knowledgeable, um, knowing what's not only what's been said in other opinion pieces, but what's been reported about an issue is really important. And it should help inform your opinion about the, the topic. And then include the research in your piece. So again, like if you drop a good statistic or one or two or three good statistics, especially, if you include a quote from an expert on the, the whatever the topic is, um, if you include, you know, I mean, even including like an anecdote from like, again, I'll go back to the example. If you were writing about the riot um, in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, if you included an anecdote from that day, like I think everybody, everybody knows like the shaman guy with the bullhorns, right? Like include an anecdote about him or whatever else um, to help illustrate and support your opinion. And then the final thing is don't apologize, like have your opinion <laughs> and, you know, have the facts to back it up. Like, I think just going off with an uninformed opinion can be, you know, again, sometimes it has its place often in writing, it can be really um, actually detrimental to the argument that you're trying to make. It's a, totally okay to have an unpopular opinion, but that's what makes the first two steps really important. 
And particularly, like I live in Hoover, so I'm not far from you guys. I'm south of Birmingham. Um, I know that people have really varying opinions on race and politics and, and lots of other things in the South. Um, and a lot of times my opinions don't align with those of my friends or even my family. And so really knowing what I'm talking about and knowing why I, I think the way I do and why I believe that the things that I do is really important, you know, not even just in um, in writing, but in even in everyday conversations. And it goes both ways. You know, I think it really does go both ways, whether you're um, conservative, whether you're liberal, or whether you're somewhere in between on the political spectrum. So, you know, I really advocate for stating your opinion clearly, like don't beat around the bush, tell people what you mean, and just understand that not everybody's, not everybody's going to agree with you. Um, and then again, make your argument. Don't just rely on emotion, but like get in there and do your research, write that thing up and don't, again, don't apologize for it. It is totally fine to have an opinion that doesn't match up with the majority of people at your school. That's fine. What I'm encouraging you to do though, is to have an informed opinion and I think that that is what makes your opinion powerful and that's what wins people over. And even if it doesn't win people over, that's what causes people to engage in conversation because they're not just gonna write you off as you know, somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about. So before I go to questions, I did wanna share with you guys um, a piece that I wrote for my job. Um, it is a piece that was in Nonprofit Quarterly. And just to kind of explain a little bit because it's the piece the author of the piece is Keisha Harris who is my boss um, but I actually wrote the draft of the piece and then she went back in and kind of added to it it's called ghostwriting and so in the professional world sometimes somebody else will write a piece on behalf of somebody else um, and I'm going to share my screen and just kind of walk through my process with this really quick let's see there it is So last summer, um, as you guys know, COVID had, had hit, um, like it was probably around the beginning, beginning or middle of March when COVID really started to become like a major presence in the United States. And um, then in, in midsummer, I think it was in like the, maybe the end of May or early June, um, George Floyd was murdered, which was a whole other like that brought about a whole other um, realm of discussion around racial equity, what it means to be black in America. Um, and then also even conversations around these sort of colliding crises within black and people of color communities around COVID and disparities related to healthcare and treatment by, of black people by police. So in, in light of the impact of COVID on BIPOC communities, we decided to write, and more specifically Black communities, um, we decided to write a piece about the need for philanthropic organizations to give money to organizations that were working in Black communities, and specifically organizations that are, that are led by Black people who live in those communities. It's actually a really big problem in philanthropy that um, the leadership in philanthropy is like majority white. And so they like to fund white groups, like white led groups, even white led groups that are sometimes working in communities with people of color, but they're not well connected with the needs of those communities because they're not actually a part of those communities. So um, started looking into this and there had been some stuff written about it, but there wasn't a really strong black voice um, of somebody who was really familiar with philanthropy who had just kind of stood up and said like, y'all have to start doing something different. <laughs> um, so what I did was I looked at some numbers from the CDC and from some other places about like, okay, well, why is COVID hitting black communities so hard? What, you know, like, are these numbers for real? Like we kind of hear a little bit about this, but is this really what's happening? And there is lots of evidence to support that. So we made that argument and then we made an argument related to um, essential workers because 
there are a disproportionate numbers of black and when I say I'm sorry I've been using the term BIPOC and I just assumed y'all knew what that meant y'all know what BIPOC stands for right black indigenous it stands for black indigenous and people of color so it's just like an abbreviation um so specifically black and some Hispanic folks are like disproportionately represented in the groups that throughout the pandemic have been considered essential workers that includes like grocery store workers, retail workers, and even people in healthcare. Because when you consider healthcare, it's not just doctors, it's like everybody that works in a healthcare setting that is considered an essential worker. And when you look at the whole, um, Black folks and Hispanic folks are the people that are like represented in those numbers, but they're also paid the least. And so, and it's not just like janitors and, um, you know, receptionists and things like that. It's like physician's assistants and um, people who actually are working in on the healthcare side of things, but just don't make as much money as like MDs or doctors. Um, and then another issue is, was for the incarcerated where black people also represent a disproportionate number. Um, and specifically in, in some of the prisons that were having these issues, like with breakouts of COVID, um, there were a lot of people who had not even been convicted of a crime. And so they were being held in these like really terrible conditions and they had never, they just couldn't afford bail. Like that was all there was to it. They hadn't had a trial. They were just sitting there waiting. And so it was, it was almost like an intersection of race and um, socioeconomic status. So we looked at all three of those issues. And then we said, all right, we have clearly outlined that this is a problem. Now here's what you can do about it. Um, so again, did the research, like looked at what people were saying, did my research, and then wrote a really strong argument for, hey, this is a problem. Like you might not have considered this, you might not recognize that it's a problem, but you can't read this, you can't read all these facts and say that it's not a problem. Now here's why you have a responsibility to do something about it and what you can actually do. So we just kind of outlined some steps um, for people in philanthropy to consider. And this particular publication, um, it's a national publication and it's, excuse me, a popular publication with people who work for foundations. So that's kind of that's kind of like how the process actually worked in a real world piece. Um, now I would love to take some questions from you guys if you want to ask some questions. Um, that what's that website was called the nonprofit quarterly, right? Yeah, and I can um, if you want, I can paste that link into the chat. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Uh, chat. Here we go. And it was a word. Um, I don't know if you're gonna pronounce it. Oh, philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy. Yeah, it's what like giving that? out. Sorry, you can go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah. have you heard of like um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? It's usually an organization that has the word foundation on the end. So, like some of the well-known ones, there's the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And a lot of these foundations, many of them, in fact, were founded um, by rich white people um, and with really good intentions. But what has sort of happened in this, and their whole purpose is to find worthy causes and give money to them. Like they, and I don't, I don't understand like the financial workings of it, but they just have tons of money and they have like put it away in some fashion where it just keeps earning more money for them. Um, and they just perpetually have lots and lots of money to give away, which is great. Um, but sometimes they have a hard time getting the money to the right places. And part of that is because they just don't really know the right people. And then the people they do know, they kind of trust and they understand how they work and they've seen the work that they do. Um, and so they want to keep giving to those organizations. So that does that help explain what that is? 
Yes, um, and when people ask, like, you know, like McDonald's, the Ronald McDonald Foundation, so they're like, oh, would you like to donate to the Ronald McDonald Foundation? And you give them money for that, they get tax money back by using your money to give to the Ronald McDonald Foundation. So it's like a, like a, what would that be? Like a, yeah, right up. yeah, so they get money. That's why I'm like, yeah. I have to like. It's just a way for them to get more money, I think. But then also, it looks like they're doing good, but I think sometimes they just do it for themselves. Like every time, uh, what was it? Taco Bell asks, they're like, oh, would you like to help our students with their high school education or something like that? And I'm like, you want to help me with my education? I mean, <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's an interesting. Um, that's an interesting point too because there are a lot of um like private companies that have foundation that are affiliated with foundations and so they can do what you were talking about um and get like a tax write-off I don't even know if that's the right terminology um but yeah it's an interesting it's a whole interesting field um and there are lots of issues with it but there is also a lot of good work that comes out of it and the, one of the really fun parts of my job and, and one of the really fun parts of writing pieces like the one I shared with you guys is that um, we are serving in a way to help hold them accountable to do better. And so, um, you know, that's a really good example. Of, and I mean, I can't say that like every foundation in America like immediately turned and started funding all the right organizations because of our piece, but that piece combines with other pieces by other people who either said similar things or made the argument in a different way or offered a different perspective. You know, maybe somebody that works at a foundation offered the perspective or somebody who lives in one of those communities and they haven't had funding um, can offer that perspective. And all those things combined can really serve to make a difference. And so that to me is like the crux of why writing about political and social issues is important and doing it well is important because it really can make a difference. Like all combined over time, these types of things can really make a difference. So um, I'd love to take one more question. We're right at three o'clock. And so I think there's probably another session that's about to start, but um, if I, I'll take one more question if you guys wanna ask one more. Okay, you're all good. All right, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. You did amazing. Bye. 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 Bye.